Services such as rocks, shells, docks, and vocals. And they're similar to sponges, except some of the ways you can tell them apart is if you poke a sponge, it'll bounce back, and sponges are gritty, whereas tunicates are kind of slimy. So they reproduce by broadcast flying and asexually by budding. And the larvae drift in the ocean for several hours before settling on the surface and starting a new colony. The three invasive tunicates that are mainly monitored for in Alaska are the denim, vexillium, brochuloides violaceus, and brochuloides chelosrae. One is native to the east coast and the other two are native to Asia. All three have recorded sightings in Alaska. So the dangers with them are that they can take over the native habitat and carpet the seafloor, out competing the native species. And like this bottom picture, they can cover fishing and aquaculture gear, making it impossible to use until cleaned. Um, Jadenium bexillium has been found and is thriving in Puget Sound and Hood Canal. And then in Alaska, it's been found in Woody Harbor near Sitka. And Fish and Game has requested that nobody goes there to further transport any of them. So to monitor for tunicates and the green crab, you have to have a special permit by Fish and Game. Um, so to monitor for tunicates, I go to the two parts of the harbor, the Wolverine Harbor, three times a year in March, June, and September. Most of the growth is during the summer because it's too cold in the winter. So that's why I don't go out in like December or January. The 10 plates um, are throughout the harbor and they're just a cinder block with this metal attached to it. You can come up later or now. And if you have any questions, go ahead and stop me. So the plate acts as like a dock wood. So like the growth, so <laughs> if an invasive tunicate comes, you can see that like this would act as like the dock wood. So it's like kind of an example of what is underneath the docks. So I pull it up, take a picture of it with the label, date, and dock number, and then clean it off so each time there's new growth. These photos are then uploaded to the website platewatch.nisbase.org, which is a statewide network, the Invasive Tunicate Network, that's made up of volunteers in Alaska to help encourage the early detection of marine invasive species. And so anybody can go on this website and see the different monitorings around the state. They do it in a lot in the southeast, and I think they're starting it in Whittier. So what is that in the upper left picture? Oh, so that, these are two um, plates in the harbor. That is uh, Coriola inflita, which is a type of tunicates, um, not an invasive one. And then the other picture is of a starfish. So like the 10 times that I've done this, twice there's been a starfish um, that somehow <coughs> made it onto the bottom of this hanging below the dock. One of them was on the side, so I don't know how they would get there. Here are two more pictures, so you can see. Um, so are those both tunicates as well, but they're just native ones? Yeah. So you haven't seen the invasive tunicates in the harbor? Uh -huh. No, so there's been no invasive tunicates <laughs> or green crabs. She said we could ask Yeah, that's one. So here's the location oh, wow. of the harbor. There's two in the old harbor and then eight in the new harbor by AC. Um, each one has one plate except for this one that has four to show one area can have lots of variability. There's also a temperature logger that Scott Pater does. So when I go out, I collect the temperature also. Is, is, it, is the thinking that if that it would be introduced to the harbor first because it would come on boats? Or is it just that that's the easy place to monitor? It's, yeah, most likely that it would come on a boat, like on the hold, um, balance of water. But that's mostly with the tankers. Um, yeah, just an easy spot. Oh, balance of water. Yeah. And so if you see them, don't mess with them because um, we want to see like how a natural dock would be like. So then for the green crab, um, they're listed as one of the 100 world's worst invasive species. They're originally native to the Northeast Atlantic Ocean on, in the Western European coast. Known, and there they're known as the sh 
store crab. They have a carapace weight width of four inches and they're most distinguishable by the five spikes on each side of their eyes. And here's one passage of that. So they, even though they're called the green crabs, they can vary from <coughs> green, brown, to gray or red. And they can live in a variety of habitats like mud, rock, sand, and even marine and estuarine habitats. They can also live in a wide salinity range from 4 to 52 parts per thousand and a temperature range from 32 to 86 degrees Fahrenheit. So this makes them easily, um, they can easily adapt to a wide range of habitats. They eat bivalent mollusks, mollusks such as clams, oysters, mussels, and even small crustaceans. The females can lay up to 185,000 eggs three times a year and the larvae develop offshore and then the juveniles move into the intertidal range. So here's a map of where the green crab currently are. The blue is their native range <coughs> from Iceland to Scandinavia and then down to the northeastern coast of Africa. The red is introduced range where they're thriving and then green is the area potentially at risk. Do they get kind of bright green, do you know? Well, it, well, I think I saw a bunch of them higher when I see them out there. Oh, really? Oh, and so the black is a lone sighting. So it's a what? A, there's only been one sighting of it. Oh, maybe not then. Um, so they first found in North America in Massachusetts in 1817, and now you can find them on the East Coast from South Carolina to New Finland. And then they were first found on the West Coast and in the Pacific in 1989 in San Francisco. And then in 1997, possibly due to El Nino effects, they moved to Oregon and into Washington in 1998 and into British Columbia in 1999, which is as far north as they've gone on the West Coast. They also have been introduced to small parts of South America, South Africa, and Australia. And it's thought that the green crab could possibly extend its range from Baja, California, all the way up to Alaska. So the problems with the green crab is that they eat bivalves, fish, crustaceans, and pretty much anything smaller or up to their size. In California, they caused a decline of a native species of clam, which allowed an introduced clam to move in after them. They've also destroyed softshell clam fisheries on the east coast. This predation could result in the decline of bivalves such as scallops. And, um, this, since they eat young, such as oysters and dungeness crabs, this could possibly cause declines in populations and quotas of this fishery, depending on how they affect them. And so this picture is from when I presented a similar project at the World Wilderness Congress in Spain. We were at a fish market and so they're selling these there. So people do eat them, and then since they've been introduced to the East Coast, they have a fishery for them, and they collect 1,300 tons annually. So they are edible, which could be one of the solutions if they were to move into an area having a bounty or fishery for them. So to monitor for the green crab, I go out once a month um, during the summer from May through September, it has to be at least a negative one foot tide so the traps are fully submerged at high tide. The three sites are Hardy Bay, underneath the Science Center dock, and Fleming Spit by the new boat haul out. And that's a picture at Fleming Spit as the tide's coming in. So I place five crab traps which are specifically designed for the green crab and then one of the conical uh, minnow traps at each site. They each get half a herring and then are tied down to a stake so they don't drift away. Um, then I go up the next day after 24 hours and count and measure the number of species and then bring the traps in. Uh, this data is then put into an Excel spreadsheet, which I put into an end of the year report for our CAC. So here's the three locations. So Isle of Arnie Bay is like halfway down the road and then a quarter of a mile out into the mud. And I've never seen any crabs, I've only seen scope in there. And then in the harbor, it's underneath the Science Center dock, which is one of the more likely spots to find them because of um, the boat traffic. And then again, Fleming Spit, 
would be another likely spot because of the boat haul out and then also the boat traffic with the fuel dock. And here are some pictures. The top left one is at Harney Bay uh, picking up the traps. You can see all the seaweed that came in on the stake. There's usually a lot of seaweed covering the traps, so it makes it hard to find what's in them. And then the top right is a decorated crab. The bottom left are two hawk crabs. And that fish eel thing, I was told, is a bunny. And then two more hawk crabs on the bottom right. So those are all native species. What kind of crab do you see on the right? Helmet crab. Oh, helmet crab. And then here's some of the more interesting things found. Uh, the top left are two huge sea stars, and it's only happened underneath the Science Center dock in the same spot twice, two consecutive months, and then there's two in it, and then there's also one here, and there's another one over here, trying to get at the bait or whatever was in the trap. And then the bottom two pictures are sculpin, and so they have these two little spikes that get caught in the traps, you just have to shake them to get them out. In the middle is a juvenile sculpin, and then the top right is Lenny again, in the middle trap. Did you say Lenny? Lenny? Lenny. Lenny. How's it spelled? B L E N N Y? It, yeah, it looks like a heel. Uh, here's an example of Excel, Excel sheet. So this was June last year at Hartney Bay. Um, See the tide and the time um, there, and then so for each trap. So this one, the first trap had 11 sculpin, ranging from 3 to 8 inches. Some of the traps had none, so it's kind of inconsistent. It, there's no real pattern to it. So the way um, they can be transported, which is a big problem for Alaska and especially Prince William Sound, is mostly by boat. And so some of the ways they can be transported is in ballast water or attached to ship, ship holes like in this picture. And then also in aquaculture gear, like live packing equipment like seaweed, and then ocean currents like what moved them up to British Columbia, like the El Nino. And so this diagram shows how when the tankers are coming from uh, the west coast, to Alaska, they don't have anything in their cargo hold, so they have to load up with ballast water um, to stabilize themselves. So they'll either put it in the hole or directly in the cargo container, cargo hold. And so if it's directly, if it's in the hold, they can pump it directly into the Port of Valdez. But if it's in the cargo hold, it goes to the ballast water treatment facility, but that only takes out the oil. So anything that they pick up in the water off of the West Coast, they put it directly into Prince William Sound. And one of the facts that uh, RCAC came up with last year was that of all the last uh, tankers in Alaska, 85% of the ballast water in the state is put into the Port of Valdez in Prince William Sound. So a lot, it's like a high mm -hmm. likelihood that this could be an invasive species. Is there monitoring in Valdez? Yes. So there's monitoring in Valdez, Cordova, and then Whittier also just started. Um, Green crab So the results tell me there's no green crabs or tunicates <laughs> found in uh, Cordova. So this data can be used as a baseline. So if a green crab were to invade, we can tell um, how they've affected the ecosystem. Like if the hermit or helmet crabs are declining, possibly because they're fighting for the same food source as the green crab. Um, also, there's lots of sculpin. You can tell that um, at least where the traps are in Hartney Bay, there's not it's not good habitat for crabs. Here are some graphs of what I found about the green crabs, and these are just from this summer. So this shows the number of organisms per month per site. So the blue is Hartney Bay, the pink is underneath the Science Center dock, and the green is Fleming Spit. So um, June this year was the most productive month. They had over 70 total organisms. The most were at Hartney Bay. They had 31 sculpins between the six traps and then Science Center 19 and Fleming Spit had 25. 
So May was the least productive. <coughs> Graph shows the total number of different species per trap. So Hardy Bay only had sculpin, so there's only one. And um, the Science Center had the most number of species, which was six in July and September. So that's like sea stars, hermit crab, shrimp, different types of fish. And then this graph shows the total number of crabs per month per site. So the Science Center had the most, which was 12 crabs, which includes hermit crabs in June. Um, this is a really cool video. If you want to YouTube green crabs in Freeport, <coughs> Maine, uh, they talk about how it's affected their different fisheries there. And they have footage of just uh, digging in the mud and hundreds of crabs just crawling around. And then lastly, um, if you see something suspicious and you think you see a green crab or a tunicate, you can call me or Fish and Game does the same thing. And we can get you connected with the people to identify it. Also, if you'd like to come and do this sometime over the summer with me, I have a sign up sheet. And then this is my last summer with this internship. So I'm looking for someone, preferably in high school, that would like to do it. And they can take over the internship. It's a paid internship with RCAC. If you find them early, can you do anything about either one? Um, possibly. Um, Washington, when they first came into Washington, they um, had like a bounty for them. Crabs? For the crabs, yeah. And they caught like 400 each year, but they still um, invaded and they didn't really do much in the long run. I can imagine there's much meat on those. <laughs> They're <Yeah>. pretty tiny. <laughs> yeah. So if you want to come up with some um, examples of invasive tunicates, so you can see the trap. Um, so like the herring bait goes in this little bay and it cinches up the crabs or anything crawling through here and then gets stuck. So did you buy that or make it? Um, RCAC support. And then the traps were from RCAC and then the watershed project. That's extra ones. Okay. Very cool. Good nice work. Yeah. Well, let's hope you don't find any. Yeah. <laughs> and how do we get rid of the sculptures, the indigenous stuff? <laughs> what? <laughs> the sculptures. Want to get rid of the native wildlife? Oh, God, yes. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>